We live in a world which is full of content and information. Social media, online or through films and TV, we're surrounded by a constant stream of it. And that all impacts how we live our lives, both for good and bad. We're exploring Paul's teaching in Philippians 4 about how we can experience God's peace. And one element he focuses on is what we fill our minds and hearts with. And that seems particularly relevant in our connected world and generation. What are we focusing our attention on? Just after his famous words about experiencing the peace of God which transcends all understanding, Paul continues. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. What does that look like in practice? And how does it help us experience the peace of God? At first glance, Paul's encouragement to think about whatever is excellent and praiseworthy may seem to be moving on from the theme of peace. But just a couple of moments later, he circles back to it, promising that if we do these things and also follow Paul's example, then the God of peace will be with you. There's an obvious connection between our thought patterns and what we focus our minds on and our experience or not of peace. Modern medicine and psychology have shown just how powerful our minds and thoughts can be. And various interventions and talking therapies use the impact of what we think and focus on to help us with our mental and emotional health. So this is obviously a huge area which we're only going to touch on here. And it's important not to overstate what Paul is promising. This isn't the solution to everything. But it is something powerful and effective for helping us experience peace. He tells us to focus on whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely or beautiful, admirable, what, whatever is excellent and praiseworthy. It's quite a list and we'll unpack it a little bit more later. But essentially he's saying think about anything which is good and beautiful. And I've been reflecting on how much joy and peace the things in my life and thoughts that are good and beautiful bring me. The countryside near me is stunning and I love walking through it, enjoying the views or flowers, listening to and watching the birds and just generally appreciating the beauty of God's creation. When I lived in London, I used to love the old buildings and beautiful architecture or the chance to go to the theatre or a concert or a good restaurant. In our modern connected world, even those things we can't experience directly are opened up to us through social media and the internet. We can listen to great music on our phones, watch a nature documentary from anywhere, or enjoy world-class sport from the comfort of our living rooms. There is so much in life that is excellent and praiseworthy. And I'm sure that with just a brief pause for thought, you can bring lots of different things to mind that bring you joy and delight. And Paul is telling us to focus our attention on those things, and that if we do, that will help us experience peace. Interestingly, various scientific studies have explored this and shown that art, music or nature can have a really positive impact on our mental health and well-being. For me though, perhaps the greatest example of all this lies in my relationships with the people closest to me. Friends and family can bring us so much joy and peace. I'm so blessed and helped by my wife Liz, my daughter Beatrice, my mum and my close friends. When I think of all that is good in my life, well, they're top of the list. And I think Paul had them in mind here too. Most of these words are particularly associated with people and character and what we do. Whatever is true or noble or pure. And these are words that describe us, our actions and way of life, or at least what they should be. And so Paul isn't just talking about beauty or good things in general, but people too, and all that's excellent and praiseworthy about them. And he tells us to focus our attention on that. The list he gives us, though, is quite open-ended. 
as we've already seen from the range of things we've looked at, Paul doesn't seem focused on tying down the details, but more giving us general principles. In fact, many modern scholars have highlighted similarities between Paul's list here and other ancient virtue lists. And I wonder whether that's deliberate. Almost as if Paul's saying, you know the sorts of things I'm talking about. You don't need me to fully spell them out. All that matters is that they're excellent and praiseworthy. And we can then work out what that looks like in our lives and our context. The key though is that we do then focus our attention on them. And the word that Paul uses here when he says think upon such things is really quite intentional. In Greek, it's logizdomai, and it's not just talking about passing thoughts, but something more deliberate. It's a word that implies careful thought and focus, letting your mind dwell on something. And it's also a word that was used in commercial settings for working out the value of something. And I wonder whether Paul has both elements in mind here. He wants us to be intentional generally in our focus on whatever is excellent and praiseworthy, but also to be generous in our evaluations of things and people, highlighting and focusing on the good and not the bad. When we do that, we'll find that that draws us closer to God and his peace, and the God of peace will be with you. I think that's partly because if we do the opposite, it can just pull us down and drown us in negativity and worry. We're easily drawn to the negative and controversial, if you don't believe me, just look at the weight of content in our news headlines or on social media, where bad news, outrage and controversy seem to generate many more views and likes and engagement. And yet, even as we're drawn to those things, they stir up worry and fear and anxiety rather than peace. Even within the church, there can be lots of focus on problems and concerns with the world and culture we live in. And we can easily respond from a place of anger, fear, even hate, rather than love and the peace of God. There's a, a famous experiment in psychology called the White Bears Experiment. A group of volunteers were asked not to think of white bears for a period of five minutes. But they found it virtually impossible. A second group were also asked not to think of white bears, but they were encouraged to actively think about something else, a red car, instead. And that group were far more successful. I think Paul had reached the same conclusion 2,000 years earlier, because what he's telling us to do here is to turn our hearts and minds and focus, and probably who we follow on social media and watch on TV, away from all that is wrong and fearful, to dwell instead on the good and excellent and praiseworthy. It ties back in with what we've explored before about rejoicing in the Lord and thanksgiving. We have lots to celebrate and appreciate, and there is so much in this world that is excellent and praiseworthy. And there's something powerful and helpful about recognising and focusing in on that. Now, that's not to say that all is well with the world and that we don't face difficulties and challenges. This isn't about escapism or denial. Paul was in prison when he wrote this and well aware of the worries and problems of life. And he does actually address those things in this passage, just a few lines earlier in a verse we've explored before. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your requests to God. Paul's answer to the worries and challenges of life isn't to dwell on them, but to pray on them, to offer them up to God. God is great enough and God is good enough that even if we don't always understand why he does or doesn't do something, we can trust him with our problems and our prayers. And I think that that God dimension is crucial here too. So far, we've been thinking about whatever is excellent or praiseworthy in general terms, and the beauty of art or music or the natural world and the joys of family and friendships are all things that can be experienced and enjoyed by everyone, not just Christians. But I think that if we were to leave it there, this would all fall short. A lot has been written about the power of optimism and positive thinking. 
And there certainly does seem to be some evidence that optimistic, positive people often thrive and flourish. But the problem comes when the optimism fails and life doesn't deliver on the positivity. Much more important than whether you're someone who sees the glass as half full or half empty is whether there's anything in the glass at all. And without God, on an ultimate level, the answer has to be, I don't know. But with God, that all changes. Our glass isn't just full, we're sitting next to the tap. Because whatever problems or challenges we may face, we know what our future holds. God will never leave us or forsake us. And his love and grace and presence will always be with us until we're gathered to glory and know the inexpressible joy and wonder of an eternity spent with God. And so when Paul tells us here to think about whatever is excellent and praiseworthy, I think God and the things of God are supposed to be top of the balance sheet. And each of the virtues and good things that Paul lists here are supremely descriptions of God himself. God is true, God is noble, God is just, God is pure, God is lovely, God is admirable, God is excellent and praiseworthy. And actually, I think one of the things that gives focusing our hearts and minds on these things more generally its power is that they reflect the nature and character and ways of God. And Paul then ties all this up, and I think the preceding verses as well, by reminding them of the example that he's given them. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. What does this all actually look like? How do we live it out? And Paul knows that his teaching and his life with his focus and passion for Jesus shows all that. He's rejoiced in the Lord and been gentle and prayed and given thanks and focused on God and all that is excellent and praiseworthy. And as a result, he's known peace, even in the midst of turmoil. What does this all look like? Well, look at me, he says. And there's something so powerful about this, because so often in life and faith, we learn the most from the example and witness of those around us. This is one of the reasons why church and community and living our lives around other people who love Jesus is so important. And there may be particular people in your life who've really helped you to grow in your faith. For me, supremely, that's my mum. I'm so grateful for all the ways in which she's taught and shown Jesus to me all my life. And so much of my love for Jesus and understanding in faith flows from her example and patient teaching of a little me. And one of my greatest prayers in life is that Liz and I might do the same for our little Beatrice. That can seem quite daunting though. I don't think I'd be quite ready to say what Paul says here because I know my example isn't good enough. But I think that's okay. And even in our weaknesses and failings, we can still point people to Jesus. The most important thing a mentor or friend or parent can do in helping us grow in faith is to constantly point us to Jesus and call us to go deeper in our walk with God. And ultimately that is also the root and core of experiencing God's peace in our lives. What Paul is calling us to do here is to align our minds and thoughts and lives with God. And as we do that, we will draw closer to God and he promises to draw closer to us. But then Paul deliberately ties that in with peace. The God of peace will be with you. And he's drawing a beautiful connection between the peace of God and the presence of the God of peace. Because the greatest and ultimate source of peace is God. It makes me think of my relationship with Beatrice. When she's scared or upset or hurts herself or something goes wrong, her first instinct is to run to me or Liz. And there may be tears and the reasons may be many and varied, but the answer she wants is usually the same mummy or daddy. And when we hold her and comfort her and love her, that's enough. And our love and presence bring her peace. Sadly, as she grows older, Beatrice will discover that we aren't always enough. But I pray that she will also discover that God is, 
and that his love and presence can bring her peace no matter the circumstances, because there is no promise of peace and shalom greater than this, and the God of peace will be with you. As we finish, let's pray. Lord God, thank you that you are the God of peace and that you have promised to be with us. Please come by your Holy Spirit and be with everyone watching now. Fill them afresh with your presence and peace and help them to live lives focused on you and your ways. Amen. Thanks so much for watching. Have you ever considered doing one of our series with your small group? If you do, we have discussion guides, downloadable versions and other resources all free on our website, burningheart.org. And I would also love to ask you to help us keep our films free for everyone. Could you pay it forward and help us make our next series, either by praying or giving? Thanks so much.